Hey, if you're new to Propel, we want to extend a huge welcome to you. And we don't believe it's by accident that you're here. In fact, there's a, an app in your app store. It's Propel Church AZ that you can download. And it's a great way to engage with us to find out more about who we are and for us to engage with you. And there's a digital connect card within there. If you wouldn't mind taking a few moments just to fill that out. And again, it's a way for us to stay connected with you, to keep you involved of all that's going on here at Propel. If you're here in person, you prefer a paper format, there's a guest card that you should have already received. And if not, you can find it in the lobby after service at the information table. And then just take a few moments to fill it out and drop it in the black box uh, of the back of the room. But these are just ways for us to stay engaged with you. Would you take your Bibles at this time, church? Grab your Bibles, grab your outlines, whether the Propel app, version, or even the paper format. And while you're doing that, if you would silent your phone so you're not a distraction to those around you. We're in this four-week series that we started last Sunday entitled Propel Is. And we're looking at our core values that help create the culture of Propel and help us to keep on track with who God has called us to be as a church as we help people find Jesus and transform culture. And I mentioned this last week, but that the reality is, is this, is that every church has a culture within it. And the Lord calls us to, to be a healthy, vibrant, and growing body of believers where God's spirit and presence is alive and well. And I'm thankful that Propel is that, that we are a healthy, vibrant, and growing church where God's spirit and presence are tangibly felt. It's so important. But without holding to our mission, our purpose, our core values, we open up ourselves to the potential of becoming an unhealthy culture, an unhealthy church that we cannot allow to happen or we cannot afford to allow to happen. And so at Propel, we talked about last Sunday that our first core value is that we are Jesus-focused. That Jesus is at the center of everything that we do. Whether from Sundays or to our Propel groups or um, outside of the four walls and in outreach, everything that we do is birthed out of Jesus is at the center. That's why prayer is so important within the life of a church and within the life of believers. He has to be number one. Everything should revolve around him. And so today we're going to look at the next two core values that we hold to. And here's what Jesus prays for us in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 23. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, referring to his disciples. He said, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now in the verses leading up to verse 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples. And then he begins here to pray for all future believers to be one with Jesus and the Father so that we would be brought to complete unity. So here's our second core value. It's that Propel is better together. You've heard us say it before, but it is true. You and I, we together are better together. And the fact that Jesus took time to pray for our unity with God and with each other as the body is significant. Jesus knew that there'd be many things that would seek to destroy our unity as the church. Jesus also knew that we would be stronger and better together, serving him. And the fact of the matter is, and will never change, is that the Lord calls us to do life together. He calls us to be in relationship with one another. Why? So that we fulfill God's purpose of the Great Commission. And to accomplish this, we need each other. We truly are better together. God didn't create us to do life alone. That's why he created 
a help bait for Adam when he created the world. That's also why he created the body of Christ, so that we would come together. And the reality is, is that God is all about relationship. As God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, they demonstrate what relationship should look like among each other. And so we have relationship with God, but then we also have relationship with each other. And so my challenge is this, don't underestimate the power of unity under the name of Jesus. There's power when we come together in unity under his name. In order to live in unity, though, we must come under the banner of Jesus. Because Jesus is the one that unifies us. Jesus is the one that unifies us with the church down the street that's preaching the gospel. He unifies us with the Father and with each other. And as we focus on Jesus in our first core value, because we're Jesus-focused, he unifies us so that the world sees our worship, our words, and our actions in unity that glorify Christ and for the world to know that the Father sent the Son because of his love. And so as we come together, the message of our unity is communicated to the world around us. Understand that the world does not live in unity, if you didn't know it. The world lives in chaos, because that's how the enemy operates. The only time that the world comes together in unity is when they unify to come against Christ. That's why all other religions, they're against Christianity, and they will unify around that one point. When the world sees unity in us, though, as the church, they see and experience Jesus and the love of the Father. That's why unity is so powerful. And that's why unified diversity in the body of Christ glorifies Jesus and advances his kingdom. Unified diversity in the body of Christ glorifies Jesus and advances his kingdom. That's who we are called to be. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 6 say, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Several verses later, the Apostle Paul says in verses 12 through 14, he says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And just as God operates in unity as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, he also operates through our unified diversity under the name of Jesus. I think we understand this point, but that none of us are the same. We all come from different backgrounds and upbringings. We each have different talents and abilities, different likes, different dislikes. We don't all look the same. We have different shades of skin. There's different heights. There's different sizes and shapes. And Holy Spirit has gifted us differently as he sees fit. God as creator is so awesome. He's so amazing and creative that he did not make us identical to one another. Understand, church, that diversity is not represented among us to cause division. It should cause us to unify and to celebrate the God that we serve because we need each other. That was God's intention from the beginning. And because we serve the same God who works in each of our lives through different gifts, strengths, and differences for his purposes. And so our differences should not become our identity. And sometimes we get caught there or stuck there. And we think, well, this is who I am and I'm different from this person. They don't define who we are. 
And you're maybe thinking, well, why is that? Let me say and share with you that ultimately they define and reveal who Christ is in us. Who our God is as the creator, they reflect his nature. Jesus is the head over us as we together form his body. Just like our personal body has many parts that Paul tells us. And so we need each other. We're, di we're diverse for a reason because we first of all represent a creative God. But also he brought us together to work together for his purposes. And so our differences reveal the creativity and identity of our creator. And as we come together in our diversity, we bring glory and honor to our creator and the kingdom of God is advanced. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Every one of us has a calling that God has placed on our life to accomplish. Verse 2 says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Not only are we to live in complete humble and gentleness, humility and gentleness, and being patient with one another... But we must keep pursuing unity at all costs because we serve one God. We've got to fight for unity as the body of Christ. We've got to strive for unity on a regular basis. Even when it doesn't feel good, even when it feels awkward, we've got to strive for unity because we serve one God. Paul says, make every effort in keeping unity through peace. When there's unity, there's peace. That means we choose unity over divisions. That means we choose unity when we don't feel like it. That means we choose unity because there's power in unity under the name of Christ. We choose unity because it reflects on who God is. And unity meaning one. That we're about one purpose. Not our individual purposes, it's about the purpose of the Lord and why we've been created and that Christ has forgiven us because of his shed blood. There is only one body of Christ, not two or more. There is only one spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is working in and through the church at large. And God only works in unity. When there's chaos, you can't experience the fullness of God moving because there has to be unity under who he is. And so we have one hope and one Lord who is Jesus. There's one faith, one true faith, which is a belief in Christ. And there's one baptism. And Paul says then that we have one God and Father over all and in all and through all. In other words, God is all about unity. God makes it very clear. And then a few verses later, Paul says in verses 11 through 13, same chapter, he says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So Paul makes clear that Jesus gave the offices or leadership gifts of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, which is also called the fivefold ministry. And these different leadership giftings function with the purpose of equipping the church so that the church grows and becomes the fullness of Christ represented on the earth. To say it like this, these verses from the lens of a mathematical equation would look like this. Equipping equals building equals unity and increasing knowledge of Jesus, which equals 
maturity. In other words, when the body of Christ is equipped, it will build. It will grow. Which then produces unity under the name of Jesus. Which also produces an increased knowledge of who Christ is as the body grows. Which in turn, the end result is that we become mature believers. That's God's heart. That's his desire for every one of us as individual believers. But as the church as a whole, he wants us to become mature. He wants Propel to be a mature church, a mature body of believers within the city of Maricopa that is loving Jesus, that is living for Jesus, that is representing Jesus in a positive way. Why? So that lives may be changed for the kingdom of God. And when the leadership gifts of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers build up the body of Christ, the church grows. It will grow spiritually and it will grow numerically. It will fulfill the great commission that Jesus told us to. That's why we're better together. The body of Christ is continually being built up as we are unified under Jesus. And as our knowledge of who he is is increasing within our lives and within the body of Christ. Understand we're not going to reach complete unity as the Bible tells us here. In the faith until Jesus returns for the church. So until Christ comes, there's always going to be some differences between different denominations or different churches that are preaching the gospel. There's some minor beliefs, but the main belief is that Jesus is the Savior and Lord. That's the banner that we come underneath. And we need the body of Christ. And so in this process of being built up and encouraged and being unified and growing in the knowledge of Christ, you and I are maturing as the Lord calls us to. I want to give you one more scriptural support regarding the fact that Propel is better together. We see in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. It's an Old Testament book near the middle of the Old Testament. And uh, Solomon wrote this book. And he says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Meaning they accomplish more together. Verse 10 says, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. Here's the point, church. Don't do life alone. Don't do life alone. We need each other. We are better together. And God never intended for us to follow Christ by ourselves. He intended for us to do life together so that we would have spiritual growth, we would have strength as we follow Christ, that we'd have support and we'd have protection. And that's why we must live in unity as we gather in our diversity because we need each other and we represent the bigger picture of the family of God. Two other supporting scriptures here are Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, where Paul writes in the New Testament, he says, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Helping our fellow believers, helping one another with their burdens, fulfills the law of Christ, which is to love one another. To love your neighbor as yourself. And we fulfill that when we accept their weaknesses and we show love and concern for our fellow believers. Towards the back of the New Testament, Hebrew says in chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, the writer says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. God is faithful. And it goes on to say, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. What's the day that it, the writer of Hebrews is talking, is talking about? He's talking about the return of Christ. As we're waiting for Christ to return, as we look forward with hope for that day, as the Bible tells us to, 
we don't give up meeting. We continue to come together because we understand that we truly are better together, that we need each other as the body of Christ. Even for this upcoming fall semester of Propel Groups, that we need that time of connection with others to help us continue to grow in our walk with the Lord. Proverbs says, as iron sharpens iron, so another man sharpens another. We need each other. We can accomplish more for the kingdom of God together. We can grow deeper roots in Christ together. And you need to know that Satan wants each of us to attempt to do life on our own and to give up meeting together. He will try to prevent us from getting into that routine of coming to church and being involved within the church and serving in some way or coming to our Propel group and and being involved and connecting and growing in our relationship with the Lord in some way. He will try to prevent it. But God desires that we come together so that our world sees our unity and love of the Father. Looking at our third core value, Moses writes this in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 through 31. He says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. That's why God created the family unit or marriage to be between a husband and a wife. One man and one woman. Because each represents a different aspect of who God is. Each point to the image of God. Verse 28 says, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And so God as creator blessed and decreed mankind's ability to be fruitful and to increase. To have dominion over the earth and to subdue it or to bring it under control. Understand that God's blessing and empowerment was not only for reproducing children. That's one aspect of God's blessing on mankind. But there's also the spiritual aspect of God's blessing. That through Christ, we advance God's kingdom as we increase by helping people find Jesus. Oh, come on, that was weak. Come on now, you're better than that. Man, through Christ, we get to advance God's kingdom. What, what a privilege that is, church. That he brings us together to advance God's kingdom right here in the Maricopa. And that we get to help people find Jesus for the first time. Come on now. All right, you're with me. Going on, here's the point. Propel is a church of multipliers. God has called us to increase his kingdom. He partners with us to see the gospel advance and for people to come to Christ. And to increase in this spiritual calling means that you and I cannot maintain right where we're at. We can't coast. We can't get stuck in a rut. A part of our God-given purpose is to increase or multiply. That's the truth. God didn't say... Sit back, don't worry, I'm just going to do everything for you. I'm just going to add the numbers. I'm going to take care of everything, just sit back. No, he gave mankind the anointing to increase and multiply physically and spiritually, but also the command to do it. He didn't say, if you want to multiply, then think about it and you have my blessing. No, he told all of us as humanity to multiply to increase, to expand and grow. And so we have a mandate as men and women to partner with God in every way to see his kingdom multiply and expand. Again, each of us here at Propel have a place and a purpose within the body of Christ. If you have breath, we're called to work together in emptying hell and filling heaven. 
if you have breath. From the beginning, God's heart and plan was to build a dwelling place for himself in the earth in men and women together. Collectively, men and women together are the foundation of the house of the Lord. And through them, God intended to live and reveal himself then to the world. In fact, as God's image bearers, he calls us to manifest his character and his authority. As a believer, as a follower of Christ, you're called to represent who Jesus is in his character and his authority that he's given you. Human life was created in God's image, we know. No other part of creation received the impartation of God's image and likeness. Just think about that. No other part of creation except humanity. Only humans. God's image and likeness referred to his nature and his communicable attributes through life, through personality, truth, wisdom, love, holiness, justice, so that we'd have the ability for spiritual fellowship with God. Together, men and women are God's representatives on the earth of his character and authority. And that's why both men and women together express God's dominion over the earth and they display his uncomparable power over the works of darkness and subdue Satan through the lordship of Jesus. That's why marriage between one man and one woman under the lordship of Jesus has power. Because under his lordship, they represent a beautiful picture of who God is. They represent his character. They represent his authority. They represent that they have dominion over the darkness of the enemy. Why? Because both are created in God's images. And our differences as men and women in marriage sometimes can become frustration. Right? Or am I the only one? Come on now. Sometimes my wife frustrates me, but I can promise you it's vice versa. I frustrate her at times too. But that's why we live in unity. We come back to it and we work it out because that's what God calls us to. And that's where the authority that God has placed on every marriage resides when we live under a submitted authority to Jesus first and foremost in the marriage, but then also to one another as the Apostle Paul writes about in Ephesians. That's why as believers, we're called to multiply and to manifest God's character and authority and why God empowered each of us with the capacity and the ability, the responsibility and accountability to multiply. Again, mankind is distinct from the rest of creation. Mankind is a spiritual being who is not only body but also soul and spirit. We possess a moral being with intelligence, with perception and self-determination that far exceeds that of any other created being. And these traits reveal the worth that we have in God's eyes. Every individual, every life is priceless to God. You and I matter to God more than what we can fully comprehend. God has given you and I the capacity and the ability to multiply. He's called us to it. You've heard the saying that God doesn't call the equipped, but he equips the called. We're called to it, and so God equips us with the capacity and the ability to multiply, to increase his kingdom. That's a part of his purpose and a part of his plan when he created you and I. And we should never be good as believers with living life on a level of existence, of just getting by. Like, I'm just going to sit here and coast, Lord, I can't wait for your return. You are missing out on what God has called you to if that's where you're at. That's lower than what God has made it possible for you and I to dwell and live at. In other words, don't settle for any other life than the one that God created you to live with and for him through Jesus. 
we should always strive for God's best in every area of our life. Because to do less is being an unfaithful steward. That's why we must be multipliers. Jesus addressed this in the parable of the bags of gold in Matthew chapter 25. In fact, Jesus holds us accountable as stewards with what we've been given. If you didn't know it, he's holding you accountable today with what he's already given you. And we will all stand before him one day to give an account of our life. In fact, just before this parable in Matthew 25, Jesus told the parable of the ten virgins, which stressed the need to be, to be prepared for Christ's return. In other words, that the promise that Jesus is coming back one day. And here in the parable of the bags of gold, Jesus stressed the need to faithfully serve him while he's away. Jesus said in verses 14 through 19, he said, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. And then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. Now Jesus went on to say that the man who had five bags of gold was faithful because he had produced five more. And that the man with the two bags of gold was faithful because he had produced two more. And so to both of these men, the master replied, Well done, you good and faithful servant. I will put you in charge of many things with the application of being now here on earth, but also in heaven when we get there to receive our reward one day. The third man hid his one bag of gold and told the master what he had done. And he said, I was afraid and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. And Jesus continued to say in verses 26 to 30, he said, his master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. A little insert here would be that that represents multiplication. Because when you multiply, it gets to the point where you have influence even where you personally didn't harvest or you didn't sow the seed because someone else has done it. Going on, it says, well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that I, when I returned, I would have received it back with interest, implying multiplication as well with the interest. Verse 28 says, so take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, at first glance, it may seem unfair to this servant because he was trying to protect what he'd been given from the master. But the fact is, the servant was unfaithful and wasted his opportunities. Jesus was saying because of the servant's unfaithfulness, he'd be eternally separated from God because he wasted the opportunity and the time that he'd been given and he wasted his life is the point of this parable. Now, some have said that the parable is about stewarding money. Some have said that it's about stewarding the talents that we've been given. Ultimately, the parable is about being faithful as God's stewards. The reality is, is that you and I are servants of Jesus. And each of us have been given much from the master that we're called to steward. Whether the means are monetary, giftings and abilities, spiritual gifts, time, our lives, and so much more, the Lord expects us to be faithful stewards with every single thing that he's given us while he's away. And so he expects us to multiply what he's put in our hands in order to produce more. And take note that the amounts that are given each of us are in keeping with our abilities. God will not give us something that we're not equipped to handle. That would include us being faithful to advance God's kingdom with our calling and giftings 
And the reality is, is that this parable is humbling in that we each will give an account one day with what we did with our life. First of all, did we accept Christ or did we not? Did we, re, did we reject him? But from there, then we're given an account of all of our actions, the things that we've said. Other scriptures talk about what we've said here on earth. We've got to be the stewards that God has called us to be. He's called every one of us to multiply and to be faithful stewards. The question is not what amount of resources we received in this life, but whether or not we've been faithful with what we've been given. Being a multiplier can be seen in the Great Commission. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says, Then Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Church, Jesus commissioned us in this great commission to multiply through his authority, which he has the greatest authority of all. There is no name greater than the name of Jesus. And all authority belongs to him and it belongs to us as the body of Christ. And so at Propel, multiplication happens through evangelism, discipleship, and missions. Evangelism is sharing your story, your testimony of what Christ has done for you. People cannot argue with your story or testimony. They may try to argue with the word of God, even though the word of God is true. And at the end of the day, it's not really debatable. But they cannot argue your story and testimony of how God has saved you, how he's forgiven you, how he's healed you, and how the list goes on of what Christ has done in your heart and in your life, in your marriage, in your family, and so on. He's called us to tell others that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life to the Father, to heaven, and eternal life. There is no other way. And the Lord gives us divine appointments. He's so faithful. He gives every one of us divine appointments in our day to share our story, to share truth about who Jesus is. And maybe you need boldness or courage to share your story in truth. But the reality is, is that Holy Spirit will give you what you need. You just need to ask him. And so we're faithful to multiply as we take steps of obedience to what he's called us to. Second, we multiply through making disciples, which is showing and teaching others how to obey Jesus and how to obey God's word. To obey everything that Jesus called us to. In other words, if you're not discipling others, we're not multiplying. As the Lord has called us to and commanded us to in the Great Commission. My question for, for you would be this. Who is pouring and investing in you? And who are you turning around and pouring and investing into? We need both within our lives. We're at all different places in our walk with God. And as we've walked with the Lord for a while and we begin to mature in the Lord, we need to look for others whom we can disciple. Maybe someone we led to the Lord that we can walk with with them in their new journey and relationship with Christ. Or maybe it's someone who's new in their faith. But the point is, as believers, we all possess the responsibility to disciple others. It's not just my job. It's not the staff's job. It's not a, a few key leaders in the church. It's all of our job according to Jesus and the word of God. Again, the kingdom of God is not about maintaining, but it's about multiplying. And then third, we multiply through missions. And supporting missionaries, missions project, and even taking missions trips to multiply God's kingdom. Being faithful to the Lord and multiplying is not about us only at Propel. We can't be a church that's all about us and the four walls. We have to be outside of this place to fulfill the Great Commission. It's about having a heart and passion for the lost outside of the four walls, whether we are personally sharing our story and testimony of what Jesus has done for us and who he is, 
or we're sending missionaries around the world. And finally, multiplication requires less of us and more of Jesus daily. As believers, each of us is called to multiply in the kingdom of God. We're called to increase and to bear fruit. And to do this, we must die to ourselves and our flesh every single day in order to be Jesus-focused. And the purpose is, is so that we can accomplish all, all that God calls us to in advancing the kingdom of God. Here's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. He says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory. And so to have God's heart and to be a multiplier, we must have more of Jesus within us and less of us to accomplish the Father's business of the Great Commission. Church, I want to remind you and I want to encourage you that we are better together. God has called us to do life together, to be in the city of Maricopa, to reach people for Jesus, to help them find Jesus and to transform culture. And we can't do that with just one or two of us, but we are better together as the body of Christ. But he's also called us to be multipliers. And we've got to think in multiplication because God works in multiplication. And you have influence. As a believer, you have influence because the character of Jesus and his authority resides in you. And as you live in that, you influence those around you, which in turn will have a multiplication effect as they influence others for Christ. That's who God has called us to be. Amen.